Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webcast, Five Habits of Highly Effective Endpoint Threat Protection. I'm Kate Carson, Marketing Events Specialist at Tripwire, and I'm excited to be part of the presentation today. Before we start, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items that will help you out today. Make sure that your audio is streaming correctly. Please note that the audio portion will stream through your PC or laptop speakers. Be sure to check your speaker volume, the volume setting on your computer, and your headset to ensure that it is turned on and volume is at an audible level. Today's webcast is presented using a slide deck. You can click on the expand rectangle on the top right corner of the slide area to enlarge. If you're not seeing the slide movement on your console, you can try refreshing your browser. If you have technical difficulty during the webcast, please click on the Help widget. It is the question mark icon on your console and covers common technical issues. If you have a question during the presentation, click on the Q&A widget and submit your question, and we will have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Lastly, I will be sending out a link to the on-demand version of this webcast and a link to the slides. Also, you may earn a CPE credit for attending today. Now let's get on with the presentation. Our speakers today are Cindy Valladares of Tripwire and Rick Holland of Forrester Research. Cindy Valladares is Director of Corporate Communications at Tripwire. In her role, she focuses on finding and sharing stories that are relevant to our InfoSec community. Her favorite motto is Nihito, which means nothing interesting happens in the office. Thus, it is quite appropriate that she leads our customer advocacy program, blog, and digital media efforts, as well as our relationships with industry analysts. Welcome, Cindy. Thank you, Kate. Very excited to be here today with you and Rick. Our guest speaker today is Rick Holland. Rick is a principal analyst at Forrester Research, where he serves security and risk professionals. Rick works with senior information security leadership providing strategic guidance on security architecture, security operations, and data privacy. His research focuses incident on incident response, threat intelligence, vulnerability management, email and web content security, and virtualization security. Rick speaks at security events including the RSA conference and SANS summits. He is regularly quoted in the media and is a frequent guest lecturer at the University of Texas at Dallas. Welcome, Rick. Thank you for having me. For more information on both of our speakers, you may click on the bio widget on the console. So now, without further delay, I'll turn it over to Rick Holland. Take it away, Rick. Thanks so much, Kate, and thanks to everybody for joining us today. I know you have busy jobs, so setting aside some time to spend with us is very much appreciated. Uh, we're going to talk about endpoint security today, obviously. Uh, one, of the, one of the analogies that I often use is that the endpoint space has been in a drought for many years. And it's kind of ironic for me. I'm sitting in San Francisco hotel room right now, and California has obviously had some really bad droughts. Um, and there's not been a lot of rain. Well, this has kind of changed on the endpoint side. We've kind of gone from this very cracked earth, like we see here, to the rain is coming down. Um, and what I mean by that is the number of vendors in the space, the innovation in the space that's occurring, that rain's coming down. But the one thing that's – and I, let, I live in Texas when I'm not traveling, and, and we've been in drought conditions as well. And one of the things that happens to ground – you know, if you go back to here, this ground does not absorb rain very well, right? When the rain comes, it doesn't get absorbed, especially when this flooding types of thing just runs right off. Well, it, we're seeing some similar type of analogy here on the endpoint space. There's lots and lots of vendors, lots of improved capabilities, new capabilities, but it's very easy for the ground to not absorb it, for our brains to not absorb it, to not know how to navigate, not have a good strategy here because there's just so much market noise occurring um, in the endpoint space. So that's one of the goals I have for our, our conversation today is to give you, you know, some, some strategies that you can do when you're looking at endpoint threat protection, when you're looking at bringing in new technology, complementing existing technology, expanding existing technology. Um, one of the survey points that I wanted to bring out, uh, just to kind of show evidence in the change of spend, we have an annual security survey at Forrester. Um, we get it in the field in April. 
uh, we roughly interview about 2,000 security leaders, director and up, and we ask them about their spending. And this particular question, the question was, how do you expect your uh, spending on client threat management to change from 2015 to 2016? Um, and you can see that 31% of SMB and then 33%, so let's just call it a third of respondents, were seeing a bump between 5 and 10% on their uh, endpoint spend. So the, the, the hype is there, um, the, the market noise is there, new capabilities are there, and people are looking to invest. I think the biggest question that my clients have is what am I going to actually invest in? And that's kind of the goal of what we're going to talk through for the remainder of, of the webinar with Cindy and I today. Just as a kind of uh, overview uh, slide, these are the five areas that we're going to dig deeper into. I won't speak more about them now, right, because we're going to obviously talk more in detail. Um, the first one is living off the land. And I don't know if we have any um, Discovery Channel fans or I guess now NBC but this is Bear Grylls, who used to have a show on Discovery called Man vs. Wild, and now he's gone off to do his own thing. But if you've ever seen Bear Grylls, he's you know known for eating all kinds of bugs and snakes and goes out to these remote locations um, and living off the land, right? He has to find what's there. There's Although if you follow the show, you also know that some of these survivor shows, um, when they're off camera, they're sleeping in nice accommodations and they may not be quite as rough as, as it's indicating. But the analogy here is that we need to live off our land. We need to live off of our infrastructure. We need to make the best out of the situation that's there. Um, there's a term that I've been using for, I don't know, probably three years right now, and I call it expense in depth. So instead of defense in depth, it's expense in depth, meaning we just keep buying more things, new things, new capabilities, and there's really no rhyme or reason to a lot of our investment. You know, um, Cindy and I, before the webinar started, we were just talking about the RSA conference in February and early March. Um, and, and think about this, you know, whatever's hot on the expo floor at the RSA conference or Black Hat or InfoSec in Europe, right, people are investing in those things. But the problem is this expense and depth mindset where we just keep buying and we don't really look at our existing investments. Uh, we don't look to see where we're getting those marginal returns. If you look in the bell curve, right, ideally, as soon as we start to go down on the right hand side of that, that graph uh, is when we want to start minimizing our investments. Unfortunately, many people don't think about it in those in those ways. And once again, it's that expense in depth. So when it comes to, and this and obviously this applies to more than just endpoint, but I think it's important to to, to bring out um, is that we got to maximize all of our existing capabilities and all of our existing investments before we do anything else. When I was a practitioner, I'd make recommendations to buy some new product at the time. It may have been Tippy Point IPS when they were brand new, um, or something else. But we already had some type of capability. Um, in, in the environment already, and maybe we weren't maximizing it. So that first part is anything you've already invested money, it's sunk cost, make sure you take care of all those capabilities. Uh, the next piece as far as living off the land is look to your existing vendors. Um, obviously, this applies both to endpoint and non-endpoint, but look at the existing vendors that are already in your portfolio, that you already have a management infrastructure, um, a platform in place for, and see do they have any of the new capabilities that you need. Um, and then finally, I don't want to say that you never would want to invest in a new capability or you would never want to bring a new vendor into your environment, but you just don't want that third bullet to be your first step. You want to make sure you do your due diligence. You want to make sure on all of your existing investments, you know where the diminishing returns are occurring. Um, and maybe that's how you start reducing money as you're trying to look for, for new budget to buy new capabilities. Uh, but we just need to have a little bit more method to our madness instead of just the kind of buy, buy, buy um, that we so often see. That, that's a great point, um, Rick. I was recently at a CISO conference, and one of the leaders there had commented that he has never had an issue with budget before. He was always um, able to put the business first, um, and one of the things that he did was not only look at existing um, technologies that he had in his area of expertise, but also across other departments. So if you're running security, look at the compliance and operational side, because quite often there will be technologies there that you can leverage and, um, you know, expand uh, usage. Oh, yeah, that's, Cindy, that's a super point, right? Don't just think of your own stack. Um, and sometimes uh, a good analogy for this as well is, is maybe on the network side. 
if you're trying to do network security monitoring, um, well, the infrastructure and networking team, they're monitoring the network uh, for network performance, availability, that sort of thing. The application uh, teams are man managing their applications from an application uh, performance monitoring perspective. You might be able to use the same tool across all these different you know, silos within the IT organization because in, in this example, it, it's a packet and it's a packet, a packet to packet, right? The different groups may have a little bit different perspective, but you might be able to get some economies of scale and investment, or there may be something that, that's already being used by your networking friends that we're not taking advantage of. So yeah, it's a really, really good point that you bring up, Cindy. The next one, number two. Number two is on prevention. Um, this is a hot topic for me. You, you're hearing a lot of talk about prevention uh, being dead, um, and it just, it really drives me crazy. Um, we just released our predictions docs for 2015 or 2016, and, and yeah, I know the, <laughs> I kind of smirk when I even think about predictions docs in general, but we, they're still very popular when we did them. And one of the things that, that we were commenting there is that we're going to see some in, in more investment in the prevention space, but ultimately prevention isn't going to be able to stop all the adversaries out there. If you're dealing with a very sophisticated adversary with capability, intentions and motivation, right? They're going to be able to get in. So you do have to fall back to detection and response. And I wrote about this in some research. I actually did a webinar with Tripwire on this, I think sometime last year, on this research that I wrote about a year and a half ago called the Target Attack Hierarchy of Needs. And this was just the strategy that I walked through customers with uh, when they're trying to be, deal with the threat landscape they're overwhelmed. And I'll briefly go through it. Um, I've done whole webinars um, on this and even on individual levels. But the first is actually have a strategy. How is it tied into enterprise risk? Um, the second one is people, staff, um, both internal and maybe outsourced people, but it's still about people. The third one's on the focus on the fundamentals. The interesting thing on that, it really lines up with the cyber sprint stuff that's coming post OPM breach. A lot of the things that the White House uh, has been saying needs to be done, really fall into, and we wrote about it in that focus on the fundamental side. Um, and then there's integration, and we're going to talk more about that. And then prevention, and then the top is detection and response, because I do recognize that we have to fall back to uh, detection and response. But just don't hyper-focus on prevention. Don't hyper-focus on detection and response. You're going to need to have both capabilities in the environment. Um, NIST, I actually like the way NIST frameworks it, uh, the, the way NIST puts it in the framework, the cybersecurity framework, which, you know, I don't know in your particular organization, but auditors that I'm working with are very interested in this. Leadership um, is learning about this and want to know how they map to it. But here you have the protect, detect, and respond, um, which kind of line up to the prevention and the detection and response side that I have there. I like the notion of protection. Use protection to reduce the funnel so that what we have to do, do detection on is, 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 is not quite as big because we do have limited resources that can't handle everything. Yeah, one of the other frameworks that um, that have been really helpful for our customer base are, is the formerly known as SANS Top 20, now part of the CIS, uh, also very pragmatic and, and practical. Um, so that might be another one to, to look for. Yeah, I think the the artist formerly known as the SANS Top 20 is, is, a, is, a, is a pragmatic one that's good to look at as well. Okay, next up. Uh, <clears throat> the adversary isn't going to hunt itself. Now, I don't know if anyone knows what this is from here. Uh, this is Vin Diesel's latest movie, The Last Witch Hunter. Now, I have not seen this movie yet. Um, I probably will see it when it comes to uh, to on demand or when it comes out to, to Redbox or something like that. Maybe I'll watch it on a plane at 36,000 feet, which I, I watch a lot of. But... Um, Hunting is really, really important function that we need to have in our environment. And, of course, this goes back to the the, uh, the comment on the previous slides around the detection and response. We've got to be able to do this. The adversaries are in our environments for over 200 days, according to some reports. In the Verizon data breach report, you know, the adversaries are – in the 2015 report, the adversaries are able to compromise the environment. They're targeting in days or less over 75% of the time, contrasted with the defenders – who are able to detect those adversaries in days and less less than 25% of the time. So we've got to be able to, to, to do hunting. We need to be able to look through our environment from an endpoint perspective, from a network perspective, and try to look for malicious, um, probably initially anomalous behavior that may actually be malicious. 
Um, the technology stack on the endpoint side, when we think about endpointing, is we need to be able to ingest threat intelligence feeds. Most importantly, we need to be able to include our internally sourced threat intelligence. In fact, I should have put that first. A lot of I cover threat intelligence as well. Kate mentioned that when she was reading my bio, and there's a there's an inclination to go out and buy you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars feeds from third parties. And now I'll talk to companies and say, what are you, go, this goes back to living off the land. How are you living off your own land? How are you, how are you farming the intrusions that have actually occurred? You don't get anything more relevant than what's actually um, the intrusions, the incidents you've had in your environment. So make sure that you, you do that. And if you're a, a distributed organization within a particular region, a particular country or across the globe, you know, you're going to want to be able to take intel that you farmed, that you lived off the land to acquire, um, and then hunt the rest of your environment for that. Um, but we've got to be able to move to that proactive state. And the manual hunting is the bare minimum, right? If I have a particular piece of information and I want to be able to hunt for it, that's, that's, that use case is very valid. But we've really got to get to the point where we're doing it at scale. We're doing it programmatically. We're taking um, maybe we generate a CSV as an example based off our own internal intelligence, and then we're incorporating that and integrating that into our network and our endpoint controls, that sort of thing. Or we've got APIs that allow us to do it. APIs, I look forward to us getting to the point where when we talk to security vendors, it's not do you have an API, yes or no. It's yes, you have an API. Now, what kind of calls can you do? Is everything in the product, in the GUI, is it APIable? Uh, you know, try to as the APIs mature, but I think you find that many companies, um, traditional security vendors, don't have the most robust APIs, don't have documented APIs, don't have SDKs for people to be able to work with them on their own. So the APIs is really important. But the reason that we want to do this bulk stuff is, look, Vin Diesel's a pretty smart guy, but he's only one guy. Um, we need to be able to have a whole lot of Vin Diesels because one Vin Diesel by himself isn't going to be able to find the adversaries fast enough. So we want to be able to use technology. Plus, we're going to have a hard time recruiting Vin Diesel. Everybody wants to hire Vin Diesel for their environment. And we all know, and this actually goes back to the target attack hierarchy of needs, that second step on staff, right? Um, we're all resource constrained. Even the managed security uh, service providers um, are having challenges finding and retaining staff. So we do want to try to dedicate to getting the people in, but we want to be able to use technology to be a force multiplier so that we have all of these Vin Diesels versus just the one Vin Diesel. I'm going to yeah, pause and for one quick second to get a drink really of water. Good. Yeah, in, in the meantime, I'll, I'll ask you a question as well, um, Rick. One of the things that we've seen, um, especially you mentioned the DBIR, the Data Breach Investigations Report, um, there is a lot of low-hanging fruit that organizations can do. A lot of the attacks come with uh, things that you would consider basic security that are not being managed. Um, and, and at the same time, we're looking for skill sets for these more hunting type of um, activities. So is is your recommendation, or what would you recommend? You know, one option would be to automate some of the things that are more basic security and develop the skill sets on the harder uh, problems. What have you seen most successfully in your uh, client base? Well, I think it's a mixture of both. Um, there are a lot of manual repetitive test tasks, rather, that organization or organizations are doing. And we'll talk a little bit more about automation in a couple um, a couple slides, but that certainly does, does an offload. I also think you, you, you know, you, uh, I'm glad you spelled out what the DBIR is. Thanks for doing that because I didn't. But there's another component uh, from, I think, the 2013 um, Data Breach Investigations Report where they made this comment of uh, why use a cruise missile when the screen door is wide open, kind of to the point you just made, Cindy, about a lot of the times the adversaries are getting in through low-hanging fruit. And this is kind of basically what I built the, uh, the uh, focus on fundamental section of the hierarchy of needs on is – some of these fundamental things that need to be done that reduce attack surface, so vulnerability uh, systems, configuration management, you really, really key for reducing attack surface so the adversary doesn't have as big of a menu of choices. Um, you can use automation to help do the discovery, uh, remediation, validation, that sort of thing to help out there. That's certainly the case. But really, you do want to, if you look at your, your, your employees and you do a gap analysis on them, right, when do your people start getting marginal returns? 
when they're doing this kind of commoditized re repetitive work that could be automated. So automate where we can. And you're seeing automation happen in, within individual security control. And then more broadly, you're seeing emerging technology that's kind of designed to help orchestrate entire environment security stacks. We're in the early days there, but certainly we want to get to the point where we can use technology to be a force multiplier for our people, to maybe make a level one person a level two, and then try to free up our resources for the more strategic work like hunting and scale. Great, thanks. Next one up, number four, a small footprint. Um, this one is of particular pain point for me. You know, I, I'm tracking roughly 50 vendors in the endpoint space, ranging from traditional vendors uh, that have been in the space to startups. It's quite overwhelming. And every time I get on a briefing with someone, they all claim to have a small footprint. I'm getting small footprinted to death. In fact, last summer, or I guess it would be summer before last, about a year and a half ago, um, I did this, this you know, uh, Pulp Fiction meme with say small footprint again because everyone says they have a small footprint. And I always will call people out and say, well, what does that actually mean? Every time I talk to a vendor, they say small footprint. Who would say we have a large, obtrusive, painful footprint that's going to be difficult for your users, difficult for your admins? Um, so when, when looking at endpoint threat protection, um, and new capabilities, you really have to consider the footprint that's going down on the host that you have. And we're also not in the in the days of, um, you know, Windows XP, a homogeneous environment, um, and BlackBerry on the phones. Right now, we have all kinds of mobile operating systems, and then, of course, we have lots of uh, uh, Windows operating systems. Um, OS X is really picking up in the enterprise significantly. So we have to think about the footprints that are out there. Um, the reason there's really two reasons, and I used to, I think when my last practitioner job um, at the University of Texas at Dallas, I may have managed five endpoint agents between a configuration management agent, a uh, endpoint traditional AV agent, a, a, a guidance uh, agent for forensics, and a couple others as well. You know, the the more a, the, the the more uh, the more agents you have, right, that bigger that footprint is. And then the user experience can be terrible. You know, having run, you know, the product formerly known as Cisco Security Agent and having pop-ups there, or if we think about and go back further, Black Ice and all these pop-ups that happen on the user, right? You know, we're just training users to click yes to things, which then defeats the security. So the endpoint products have to sit in the background and not invade on a person's work and make it more difficult for them to do their job. By the same token, it's really important for the admin experience to be transparent, as transparent as possible, reduce the friction there. You know, I think back to my days of um, training host intrusion prevention and having to look through uh, individual logs and what would have been blocked and spending all this time, just a real, really painful experience for the admin. We need it to be easier for the admin as well. Um, because the net result is we get this, you know, yet another agent syndrome, great, there's something more that we're piling on, it's bad for the user, it's bad for the admin. So when you're looking at, when someone says they have a small footprint, just what do you mean by that? Look at the size of the agent, look at how much CPU is utilized, understand the total impact and the number of agents that are running, both agents that maybe you control as security agents, but maybe someone else covers the systems management agents. Uh, maybe someone else has some type of e-discovery agent that's being used to to do those e-discovery pieces. And then understand, you know, is this operating in a kernel mode? Is this operating in user space? Um, test them out in your environment. Make sure there's no negative implications because, once again, this goes back to the user experience. If you've got something running in the kernel that's bumping up against other things running in the kernel and causing problems, you're going to want to test it out to make sure you understand the implications of, of deploying that particular piece of technology. So... Small footprint is required, but we need to challenge people and get a better understanding of what that small footprint means within that vendor stack and then how it impacts your overall stack that you have running on these endpoints. And when I say endpoint, you know, I, I'm saying workstations, servers, laptops, it's that the, the larger context of endpoints. Yeah, thank you for that definition of it because everyone has a different um, uh, perception of that could be, you know, so it – any uh, any system that could hold data uh, is the way I, I read endpoint. Uh, but you made a really good point um, earlier on in this section, Rick, about the the depth and breadth um, of the agent as well. And that's something that um, 
we, we truly believe in in terms of supporting not only uh, the, all of the policies and, and, um, uh, and uh, compliance regimens, but also all the different platforms. As you were saying, we're not homogeneous anymore in the organization. So thank you for making that point. You're very welcome. Yeah, come, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more when I get into the table that I have at the end. But people want to stack as many functions as possible to reduce that total footprint that's out there. Because I also understand, too, as a former admin, um, when we were bringing in, uh, as a practitioner, the product used to be ConfigureSoft that was acquired, right? We had to get buy-in from another party to even be able to put the agent down. Um, you know, there's a lot of challenges politically sometimes, and political capital can be burned organizationally when trying to deploy new agents. So there's a there's, it's not as just as easy as the technology itself. And then finally, visibility isn't enough. Um, it is not enough to see bad things happening. Uh-oh, the alarm's going off, the alarm's going off, but the doors don't lock, right? We have to move away from just visibility. Visibility is a great first step. Many organizations just don't have the visibility that they need, but once you see something, <laughs> I was just thinking of the, just because I was flying yesterday, the see something, say something from the TSA, uh, it's more like see something, do something. Saying something's not enough. We actually need to do something. Um, and one of the things that I use um, to just at a high level kind of illustrate the way organizations go through detection and response is this graphic here. And we want to have as much automation in here as we can. But if you look at the left, you have actual intelligence. And there's really three ways that people look at this. They have the, at the top, it's the reactive. This could be a third party breach notification. Uh, could be an FBI notice. Um, it could be a um, Brian Krebs article, right? Now we're flashlights are going, or the flash, the red lights are flashing. Um, we're running around like chickens with our head cut off. Then we have our more proactive hunting there in the middle, right? Which we just talked about is that need where we've got some information where we're trying to you know, reduce that time of detection because we're we're going out and doing something there. And then finally, you have the uh, proactive prevention, right, that is going on. And we want to automate as much of that, that as we can. You move into the triage stage, we're trying to assess something. Triage, you have enrichment occurring and things like that. You're watching the adversaries in the environment. Then you move to containment. Um, and then ultimately you move to eradication. And the difference between the two is contained to be like whack-a-mole. Ultimately, in eradication, you want to have the visibility to have enough understanding of the adversary in the environment so that when you're ready to have your eradication event, you kill connectivity to the internet. You go and do all of your removal of their implants, if we're talking APT, but all of their technology um, uh, that's in your environment they're using to maintain persistence at once. And you want to have automation in these steps as much as possible. But I have some specific suggestions um, when it comes to automation. Um, the first piece is all automation doesn't have to be, you know, we're going to kill legitimate traffic. Um, you know, the there's a, I think there's a reason why a lot of IDSs are deployed as IDSs and not intrusion prevention systems, or why a lot of web application firewalls might just be essentially a web IDS versus actually blocking bad things, because people are so scared of you know blocking legitimate traffic at the expense of perhaps letting an adversary persist in the environment and then and then move move out. But the second bullet there, right? Human intervention. Wouldn't it be nice if we have the automation and the stack built up? So that when we're ready to move to this eradication phase in the top right, we can press a button and that automation happens. It's kind of guided automation. Um, we're not just blindly automating something. Um, enrichment can be automated. So here, within any security control you have, obviously endpoint as well, what other types of enrichment can you bring in automatically to help the admin to the analyst be more successful? So this could be internal data based on identity of, of, of who's associated with IP addresses. It could be passive DNS information, it could be GOIP information, it could be domain information, those sorts of things. But we can certainly automate enrichment and not cause any problems of taking out legitimate traffic there. Um, and we look at automation from the endpoint uh, to the identity. Example there might be, you know, we see something odd going on in the endpoint, um, looks like someone's trying to brute force um, an account, or perhaps they have my credentials and now they're trying to laterally move. So maybe in an automated fashion we go out and disable my Active Directory account, so that, that no longer works. Um, we work with uh, Endpoint, send something off to maybe a, a network access control device that contains a particular host. But we've got to have these steps built in, and it's going to be a crawl, walk, run. We're not just going to immediately start sprinting. That would be a very bad idea. You wouldn't make it far in a marathon if you immediately started sprinting. 
Um, you've got to you've got to have a strategy involved if you want to reach the finish line. And of course, there really is no finish line in our space. I often make jokes about the um, the White House Cyber Sprint, you know, that came out in in the summer. You know, there is no such thing as a sprint in our space. It's it's more like a marathon. It's got no finish line, um, and you have no legs, and you're just kind of scooting around the ground trying to to go on and on forever. It's a it's a it's certainly a journey with no finish line for us. But we can't immediately go to start sprinting. We've got to take our time, do the right things, build up from there. Eric, before we move to um, this wrap-up section, as I hear you talk about this, um, you know, crawl, walk, run, uh, we had a, a customer who used a combination of automated feed alerts and also human interaction um, and created a, a really great story of how Tripwire ruined his day but saved his year. So I am going to put the <laughs> YouTube link here. <laughs> it was a really interesting story. You know, it's just like, yeah, it ruined, woke, woke him up in the middle of the night, definitely ruined his day and the rest of his team, but um, definitely was able to, uh, you know, catch a zero day before even it was announced. So it was a fabulous story. Um, so I'll share it with uh, with the attendees here through a link. Uh, yeah, that does sound like a good story. I look forward to seeing that as well. So as I kind of wrap up, what I wanted to do was kind of obviously five suggestions from a high level, but wanted to give you some specific guidance that you can use when you're looking at the 50 plus vendors out in the space that are all doing something from an endpoint perspective. So I'll walk through these here. Um, the first one is as I try to bucket the vendors that I cover or talk to, you know, into the prevention, the detection and monitoring, and then the containment and response space. So wanting to get an idea of, of, of if I can stack as many of these functions as possible um, into one particular agent. Now, the bad news here is at least today, uh, we're still really looking at multiple agents for a lot of the stuff that's out there. But understanding where they fit in this in this spectrum, what their roadmap for 2016 is, um, as far as what they're going to you know add, um, you know, is it just monitoring only? Okay, now it's you know see something, do something type of thing. So understanding where they fit across the protection, detection, and response uh, paradigm. Uh, the second one is operating system support. This one's really really important because. Um, and you've got different challenges on the endpoints, you've got different challenges on the servers, you might have a product that seems like the best thing since sliced bread, but it only works on Windows 7, these particular versions, 64-bit, whatever the case may be. So understanding what you need in your environment relative to what someone can provide is really important, including OSX support. And then when you get to the Linux side, you know, what are the different flavors of Linux that can be supported? So this is a really, really important one to understand, also understanding roadmap on what's going out there. Um, I like to ask the third one of what's your largest deployment size. The reason I like to ask this is just to understand the scalability of the product. When you start to get to, you know, 100,000, 50,000 and up perhaps endpoints, right, to be able to manage that environment, um, requires more maturity in the product. So I always like to answer that. If, if you're talking with someone that's only got a 2,000 endpoint deployment at their top, probably a startup that's not real mature, um, and so there could be some challenges associated with that, and you just want to be aware of it. I already mentioned um, the next piece here on the kernel versus user land. You know, where do they operate? And then if they're in user land, what are they hooking into into the kernel to try to get data back, um, that sort of thing. So understanding that is really important, and then testing it out, to make sure that you're not going to have uh, something bumping up against other applications running on your endpoints. Okay, a couple more, and then I'll pass it off to Cindy for the rest of our conversation. Uh, another really important one is just a deployment model. Is this on-prem uh, or is this in the cloud? You're, you're beginning to see some organizations, or some vendors rather, that it's, it's, it's managed from the cloud and understanding where your organization fits with respect to SaaS uh, services is really, really important. Some organizations are, no, we're not going to do anything from the cloud. Others, uh, their appetite may be a little bit different. So just understanding uh, where this this works is, is, is important. It's interesting. I've had some conversations with vendors in the past where I'm told that it's managed from the cloud as kind of an end note at the very end of a conversation, uh, as if almost some people are trying to hide the fact that they're being managed from the cloud because people may have objections there. So I like to ask that question up front, especially if you're trying to qualify 
um, uh, vendors that are going to support you, you know, you can use that right there as a way to eliminate based on your organizational preferences. Um, the second one here is how do you leverage threat intelligence? And this kind of goes back to the point we made on um, the ability to, to do automated hunting at scale. You know, how can I pull in JSON? What does the API uh, do? How can I integrate this in so I can have all of those Venn Diesels versus the one Venn Diesel helping me out? And then the final one is on, on the integrations. And, you know, this is integration, and, that, and I already kind of mentioned some of these, uh, the integration into a NAC system, as an example, integration into um, maybe another endpoint system that's out there um, because you're using that system to do some type of containment, integration into Active Directory, uh, maybe two-way integration, you know, the ability to be, perhaps submit files to a sandbox that someone is running on prem or in the cloud for analysis. So really understanding those integrations because nobody wants to have, once again, the expense and death, these point products that don't talk to anything else, that increase operational friction and make our jobs that much more difficult. So there's some high level um, steps with the five, um, the five steps that we talked about and then a little bit more specific requirements when evaluating the specific vendors out in the landscape. As I look forward, right, you're gonna see um, the, the protection, detection and response kind of spectrum vendors adding more capability there. So I think roadmap is also really, really important. And another thing, just to be careful, if, if you, you wanna know how many existing customers are, they have, there's so many startups in the space, they're not gonna be successful because the market is so large as far as competitive landscape. So understanding, you know, the, the, the longevity of a company is really, really important as well. So some of the startups out there, they're, they're probably not gonna be around in eight months. So something to consider as well. Um, with that, let me hand it to Cindy to continue the conversation. Yeah, thank you, Rick. And I'm only going to spend a few minutes giving you the inside look of how Tripwire can help with all of these um, habits that Rick has been talking about. But before I get into that, I just want to remind everyone, if you have a question, please submit it into the Q&A tab of um, your console, and uh, we will address them here in just a few minutes. So if we look at the first um, habit, you know, buyers must live off the land. You know, with Tripwire, we strongly believe that, and we've seen a lot of customers um, deploying us beyond their original, perhaps, PCI or SOX compliance requirements. And, um, you know, we have over 10 million endpoints deployed currently. So, you know, in the security world, we're considered a little bit of, of the older kids in the block. Um, you know, don't have the problems of the startups that you were discussing earlier on. But when you're looking at uh, the capabilities that we have, certainly, you know, we can see every change that happens on every asset, including the who made the change, which is really important when you're trying to uh, prevent um, breaches. Now, also, uh, discovery on all of the assets, applications, and vulnerability with the combination of the products that we acquired from Encircle, I think it's almost three years ago, Secure and reliable log collection with our log intelligence uh, platform of products. And um, also what's important is to have a good context between these uh, solutions so that when we tag assets in one, we can automate actions and correlate that information moving forward. So a lot that you can use with your existing capabilities if you're a Tripwire customer and are not leveraging um, us for those, we would gladly uh, want to talk to you about how to expand your usage. The number two habit was uh, talking about prevention and detection, and uh, we do believe that this is one of the components that we need to look at. Now, I don't know if it's only my screen, but I don't see the dots on the right-hand side. Um, but a couple of comments here. You know, shrinking the attack surface with configuration management and vulnerability management is very important, but then also identifying suspicious changes. We sometimes help organizations with what we call super events. We correlate that event with information that we receive from our different solutions, and we can also share that with uh, your SIM of choice if you're using one. Uh, here we go. 
Then for the habit number three, uh, we talked about the adversary isn't going to hurt itself, and we need to support integration capabilities with threat intelligence components. So the ones that you see on the screen, uh, like Cisco, Palo Alto, CrowdStrike, uh, Solstra, if you are in the financial services, um, all of these we have integrations with to really figure out what are the malicious indicators of compromise and then create alerts um, so you can do some of that hunting. The number fourth habit talked about the small footprint. And we did already talk a little bit about this in terms of breadth and depth of coverage and policies and platforms. Um, and this just gives you an idea of how um, long we've been in business. Uh, 97, I think, it's the time where we uh, established a commercial version of Tripwire. We serve over 96 countries, and we have over 9,000 customers. So we've been, a, we've been around the block. And for the habit number five, we talked about visibility isn't enough, and we need to take action on what's happening here. So with Tripwire Enterprise, you can integrate it with your existing workflow. You can increase or decrease the monitor, um, the monitoring and the continuous monitoring of your alerts as you see them fit, run executables, and investigate further for also doing the remediation and taking action. So I believe that is my section. And what I would like to do is take some uh, questions. And I know um, I know there's a couple of questions here. Okay. Um, so one of them is Rick. With so many um, with so many questions, with so many vendors, you're talking you're tracking about 50 vendors on the landscape. How how do people come with their short list? You know, what are the things that they should be considering when evaluating some of these vendors beyond what you've already mentioned on the technical capabilities? Yeah, I, I think one is look to your existing vendors that you already work with first and definitely include, you know, incumbents that you already are familiar with that maybe are other integrated into other areas in your environment. You know, including, you know, a startup or something like that, something you could look at as well. But I think you start with what you are, who you already know, proven companies like that, and then, you know, add a couple more to the mix based on other features. But I think knowing what you need, deployment model, operating system support, a lot of the things that I had on that blue slide, and then actually testing it out in your environment, making sure it's going to work. Also, depending on what it is and where PCI comes into play, as people are looking at maybe um, – trying to replace antivirus, understanding what your uh, QSA, um, your, your PCI DSS QSA person, the auditor, essentially the PCI auditor's perspective is going to be, that also comes into play because I don't think organizations have quite made the leap in most cases away from antivirus, but some are considering it. So that's also someone you want to get some perspective on any regulator that may have input on what that stack should be. Okay, great. Um, another question that I have here is on threat intelligence. Um, I, I've, I've heard comments before on organizations that some sources of, of threat intelligence are better than others. Um, your take on that would be helpful, especially if you have, um, you know, if, as it relates to specific industries or perhaps it's a broad, you know, threat intelligence sources question. Yeah, it's, I just finished like a nine month report on threat intelligence providers, but this kind of goes back to um, the living off the land analogy. You know, relevancy is really, really key with threat intelligence, and you're really not going to get anything more relevant to your environment than what you are collecting from your own intrusions. So, once again, starting with your own intelligence is really, really important. And then, and I would say only after you're maximizing that living off the land again bringing in third-party providers and then fusing them together. And fusion is also in the buzzword category in, in the threat intelligence space. But ultimately, third-party providers do cast a wider net. So you want to lay over what you're seeing in your own environment with what these external companies, organizations are seeing. And when you, when you look at third-party 
uh, companies, um, what you want to consider in your threat model, and does this particular company collect against adversaries that are in your threat model, and understanding how they're they're lined up and relevant to to you. And so, if you are a company that is um, has no intellectual property, this is kind of a generic example. Um, you know, perhaps you don't want to pay for money for someone that's focused on espionage threat actors. Um, because they're, they're not targeting your organization. Um, you know, maybe you're more interested in someone that's doing cyber criminal actors and looking at you know, remote access trojans that cyber crime um, actors are using. So I really, really, relevancy is the key. Nothing more relevant than your internal intelligence that you're collecting from your own intrusions. And then when looking at third parties, how relevant is their product, their intelligence product, to your threat model? Great. So I don't see any other questions. So before I turn that over to Kate, um, I just wanted to um, do a last-minute plug for some additional resources. If you click on the tripwire.com slash blog, there's a lot of discussions about endpoint protection, the hierarchy of needs. Um, uh, you know, we did a blog post on that. I think it was last year based on, on your work, Rick. And um, I know you blog a lot and you comment a lot on Twitter as well. So there are some additional resources and, um, and free content that you can access by reaching out to uh, either one of us here. So Kate, uh, back to you as I don't see any other questions. Wonderful. Thank you, Cindy. Uh, thank both of you, our guest presenter, Rick Holland of Forrester Research, and Cindy Valladares, Director of Communications at Tripwire. And thank you, our audience, for joining us today. As I mentioned earlier, prior to the webcast, I will be sending out a link of the on-demand webcast <clears throat> excuse me, and to the slides. Uh, so that will come in an email, and feel free to respond to that email if you'd like to earn CPE credit for attending the webcast today. We hope that you'll join us for future webcasts. You can visit, visit tripwire.com to find out about future events. Also, as Cindy had mentioned, you should check out our award-winning blog, The State of Security. Thank you, and have a great day.